sepsis can be a frightening diagnosis. Simply put, it is the body's response to infection. Sepsis occurs when the body attempts to fight it off, releasing chemicals into the bloodstream and inadvertently triggering inflammatory responses throughout the body. Such inflammation can generate a host of changes that could lead to tissue damage and organ failure. If sepsis progresses to septic shock, one's blood pressure may drop dramatically and could even lead to death. Learn more on today's episode of CHS Presents Lifestyles at the Heart of Health. Hello, and thanks for joining us. I'm Jane Hansen. Today's conversation, sepsis. Anyone can develop it, but it's most common and most dangerous in older adults are those with weakened immune systems. Early treatment of sepsis, usually with antibiotics and large amounts of intravenous fluids, improves chances for survival. To speak more about it is Dr. Michael Klott, Chief Medical Officer at St. Catherine of Siena Medical Center, and Lori Uditsky, Director of Performance and Quality Management, also at St. Catherine of Siena Medical Center. Welcome and thank you both for being here. So the word sepsis strikes fear in people because we've all heard the stories about what can happen and very suddenly. So Dr. Klott, please talk about what is it exactly? Sure. Um, well, thanks for having us on the show today. Mm -hmm. um, so sepsis, I, I want people to understand that sepsis and infection are not synonymous. A lot of people believe that they're the same, but they're not. Um, so like a simple pneumonia may not necessarily be sepsis, or a simple urinary tract infection may not necessarily be sepsis. But what sepsis is, is infection plus the body's response to infection. It's usually an inflammatory response to infection that can be very damaging to our tissue and organs. Now, this inflammatory response is intended to contain the infection, to kill off the infection. However, unfortunately, it can be lethal to our own organs, causing organ failure, and potentially can be lethal. So the body is kind of fighting itself? Right, yeah, so there's a lot of inflammatory mediators and I'll be a little bit technical here, like uh, histamines and cytokines and interleukins, all these inflammatory cells are, are coming out. It's a huge inflammatory cascade that is supposed to it, fight off the infection, but it's also fighting off itself, injuring its own organs, unfortunately. So, Lori, talk to me a little bit about the signs and the symptoms because they're, it's a wide variety. So in early cases of sepsis, people may see that they're more short of breath, that their heart is racing, they may have a fever. Occasionally people have shaking chills that they can't control. Um, in our older population, one of the first signs we sometimes see is confusion, a change from their baseline. So even if we have a patient that may have dementia, maybe it's a sweet old lady and now all of a sudden she's combative. So looking at that change from what she normally was is significant. But isn't it true that there's so many symptoms that could be a host of other things? Mm -hmm. And that's part of the problem. That is part of the problem. And that's, that's what makes sepsis hard to recognize in the early stages of it. When sepsis is in the early stages, when it's easy to treat, it's hard to diagnose. Sepsis is easy to diagnose when it's very apparent, but then it's hard to treat. You're already behind the eight ball. How, do you, how does somebody know when to seek medical attention? Well, if you have an infection, you have a cough, you've gone to the provider, you're starting your treatment, but the treatment doesn't seem to be working. Despite the antibiotics, you still have a fever. Your breathing is worsening. Um, if you have a cut on your leg and all of a sudden now it's getting, you know, it has drainage or increased redness, increased lethargy. These are symptoms that you need to get further assessed for because the original treatment might not be working. And when you're talking about this kind of treatment, what's the most important thing that you have to do off the top? Well, the first step is recognizing sepsis, as Lori had said. Um, the next most important thing 
is early antibiotic therapy. And that's what saves lives. So all the studies point to that. So early identification, early antimicrobial therapy. What's also very important as far as treatment is concerned is, as you said before, early and aggressive fluid resuscitation. Organs require oxygen and perfusion, blood pressure perfusion. So if we don't supply that adequate fluid resuscitation, our organs will fail and go into organ failure. Now, if they don't respond to adequate fluid resuscitation, then you have to take it one step further and add a set of medications called vasopressors. And those medications will elevate your blood pressure to keep your organs perfusing well. Um, so th there's a lot going on. Also, part of the, the treatment for sepsis, and I think it's very important and everybody has to keep in the back of their heads, is something called source control. Mm -hmm. um, you have where did to find, it come from? Where did it come from, right? So if it's apparent in the emergency department, it's coming from the lungs, pneumonia, you could easily treat that, or the bladder. But sometimes if somebody comes in with abdominal pain and you scan their belly and they have a huge abscess associated with their diverticulitis, we've got to go after that abscess and drain that. Or if somebody has a perforation of their bowel, that has to be surgically repaired as well. So that's all about source control, finding where, what the cause is coming from and treating that cause. Um, as I mentioned to you before the show, my brother had sepsis, and the, the belief is that it came from a shot that he got into an inflamed knee, a cortisone shot. Mm -hmm. But nobody knows that for positive. So I guess my question to you is then, do we backtrack what it, what's happened to somebody medically over the past week, two weeks, four weeks, whatever it is, to figure out how, that, how it started, and how does that help us treat it? Well, taking a good history from the patient is extremely vital, especially if somebody who had a procedure, just, you know, that we discussed before, a few weeks before, and, and we can't find the source, and we find out that maybe the knee looks inflamed, maybe it's coming from a septic joint. Septic joint can cause sepsis, severe sepsis or even septic shock. Um, if somebody had a procedure or a hardware placed in their spine or in their knee, that's something else that we have to consider um, but isn't that it, as a source of infection. Isn't it also true, though, that, that because sepsis goes through the bloodstream, you could have something on your arm and it shows up in your knee or, it, I mean, yeah, right? Yeah, true. So, so if somebody develops a very severe case of cellulitis, that can seed into your bloodstream, into your muscles, and it can travel anywhere. It can travel to your heart, that's endocarditis. It can travel to your bone, that's osteomyelitis. Um, it can basically seed any part of your body, and that can also be very life-threatening. So what about these stories we hear where people die within 12 hours? I mean, those really aggressive forms of it, how does that happen? Typically what happens is somebody doesn't recognize those early signs or symptoms. And by the time they get to the hospital, the infection's much farther than they realize. And when they look back, they may have been maybe feeling fatigued for a few days. Maybe they just thought they had a little cold and it became much more than that. Um, I had the pleasure of being at the Rory Staunton Foundation about a month ago and meeting Mr. and Mrs. Staunton. Their son was a 12-year-old boy that um, got cut in gym, got a cut on his leg, and within less than a week, unfortunately, he uh, succumbed to septic shock. And their fight has been to bring an awareness to New York State, and they actually did the Rory Staunton um, law or proposal and made New York State the first state in the country to mandate protocols for sepsis awareness, early treatment, and diagnosis. Ah, oh, what a terrible story, though. For Heartbreaking. This. So the kid literally gets a cut in gym, mm -hmm. and uh, obviously it got infected, and then the body did what just as you described earlier, and it was never recognized for what it was soon enough. Exactly. So this, this protocol that you're talking about means that there's now ways of reporting it and educating people. I think you told me, Lori, something like more people know the signs of stroke. So the statistics say about 75% 75 75 of the people know the signs and symptoms of stroke, went to get an emergency room, but less than 30% uh, know the signs or symptoms of sepsis and when to seek medical attention. Sepsis needs to be treated as a medical emergency. It really does. So what can people like do about this awareness? How do you how do you educate yourself other than watching this program 50 times? But I mean, what what do you do? So 
Um, at our hospital, we had a health fair to educate the community. Um, Rory Staunton is actually mandating schools be educated. We teach our patients about it. 100% of our employees have to be educated on sepsis. And every person you educate, if they know about it, they'll talk to somebody else. So it's bringing the word out there what sepsis is. People know pneumonias, people know UTIs, but they don't know the cascade that goes along with it. They think they're being admitted to the hospital for pneumonia or UTI, when in actuality, they're on that sepsis spectrum. Mm -hmm. And there's various spectrums, correct? There's sepsis, there's severe sepsis, and the septic shock, which has the worst prognosis and highest mortality. So I'll explain to you briefly which each one is. So sepsis is infection plus an inflammatory reaction. The medical world, we call it SIRS, which stands for Systemic Inflammatory Response Syndrome. Um, there's four components to SIRS. All you need is two components mm -hmm. plus and infection, that's... and that's sepsis. Okay, I'm going to ask you to hold the last the other two definitions sure. until after this break because we're going to take a break and come back with a lot more information about sepsis. Stay with us. Welcome back to CHS Presents Lifestyles at the Heart of Health. We're continuing our conversation with Dr. Klott and Laura Yaditsky from St. Catherine of Siena Medical Center. So you were in the process of defining this kind of mm -hmm. spectrum of sepsis. Right. So, so I'm going to, so just to backtrack a little bit. So sepsis is equivalent to infection plus an inflammatory reaction of the body. And we call that SIRS, which is Systemic Inflammatory Response Syndrome. A couple of important things I want to mention about SIRS, though, is that with SIRS, you need two components out of four. And some of the components are the following, and I think people should know about this. You could have a high fever. You could have a low temperature. So just because somebody has a low temperature doesn't exclude infection. The other thing is mm. a high white cell count, which includes infection, or it could be a low white cell count. So just because somebody comes in this with a white cell count of two doesn't mean it's not infection. It's so confusing. It is confusing. That's why I'm going over it. Um, and elevated heart rate and elevated uh, respiratory rate. So those are the SIRS criteria. And it gives the clinician an idea that these are clinical inflammatory markers to look for. That's what I look for when I'm looking at a, a patient to we decide whether or not they're septic or not. Now, one step above sepsis is severe sepsis. Now, severe sepsis is everything I said about sepsis plus organ dysfunction, organ failure. It could be any organ. It could be your liver. It could be your kidneys. If somebody has hypoxia, that's acute respiratory failure. Somebody has a blood pressure, systolic blood pressure less than 90, that's also severe sepsis. So any, you can have one organ system, you can have multiple organ system. And the other one Lori uh, was talking about before is, is the central nervous system, where somebody can come in and present with confusion or disorientation, altered mental status. So sepsis plus altered mental status is severe sepsis. So again, severe sepsis is sepsis plus any end organ manifestation. Going up on the cascade is septic shock. Now, septic shock is basically somebody who's hypotensive, meaning a low blood pressure, that's persistent regardless of fluid resuscitation, meaning you gave them fluid and they're not responsive mm -hmm. to the intravenous fluid. That's the definition of septic shock. And at that point, as I mentioned before, you have to start that class of medications called vasopressors. But how susceptible are they going forward to getting it again? Well, it depends on um, their comorbidities. Um, elderly patients are more prone to sepsis. Um, if they're immunocompromised, like cancer patients are immunocompromised, there are medications that they're on, the chemotherapy causes immunosuppression. Patients on chronic steroid use are immunocompromised as well. Even with patients with chronic diseases, for example, COPD, emphysema, or chronic kidney disease, these patients are also immunocompromised from baseline. And I think we said this before, elderly patients, so, or, or maybe very young patients are both immunocompromised. Very so the two young, two young and the two older patients. What's the youngest you've seen, babies? Babies. Yeah. Newborns can get uh, sepsis. You know, there's this common misconception that you actually get sepsis in the hospital. 
Most patients actually come in the hospital with sepsis, but they think they're being admitted for pneumonia, UTI, a cellulitis. But it's the sepsis syndrome, the cascade of the symptoms that requires the hospitalization. Um, once they have organ failure, they need fluids, they need IV antibiotics, you need to treat them promptly. We need to use the word sepsis more in our community so people are aware of it. I think sometimes people are scared to tell somebody they have sepsis because of the negative connotation right. with the word. Mm -hmm. But we need to explain that there are different phases of sepsis. Right, they think they've done something wrong mm -hmm. to get it. Is there a way to prevent it? There are ways to keep yourself healthy. Hand washing is the number one way to prevent the spread of infections, whether it's in a hospital, in the grocery store, or at home. We need to wash our hands. Uh, if we're sick, covering our mouth with a tissue when we cough, when we sneeze, getting our immunizations. So staying up to date on the recommended immunizations, especially the flu shot and pneumonia shots, really important in preventative health care and recognizing changes in ourselves and in our loved ones early. When you say pneumonia shots, can anybody get pneumonia shots or do you have to be a certain age? Um, it depends on certain criteria. Patients that are more at risk have, may have respiratory history, asthma, COPD, chronic bronchitis. Even if they're not in the senior population, they may be recognized to get the pneumonia shot. So the best thing is have a good relationship with your provider and ask about it. Should I get this? Is most of that stuff covered by insurance? Yes, okay. it is. And obviously you can walk into almost any drugstore and get a flu shot. Um, so when you talked about washing your hands all the time, are the, are the, the antibiotic or the, you know, the, like the, whatever you call them that you can just put in your hands, are they, do they really work? Are they good enough? They do work, but it is still good to wash your hands with soap and water. Uh -huh. Washing those germs down the sink is probably the best thing you could do, but when you don't have an alternative, using the Purell or the alcohol-based hand sanitizer is excellent. What do you guys specifically do at St. Catherine and within the CHS system to combat sepsis, recognizing it's something that a patient comes into the hospital with? So we ensure that we recognize it early. So we have a, a dedicated team within CHS as far as ED physicians, intensivists, hospitalists that are there to take care of our septic patients. We also mandate all employees to get educated on sepsis, even the non-clinical uh, employees, including environmental services or transport. Um, the reason why we mandate the education is that we want them to recognize sepsis. Now, the other thing is that um, we empower our staff, our non-clinical, RNs, mid-level practitioners, mm -hmm. PAs, to call for a code sepsis. So if they feel that something is wrong, somebody's febrile, or What's that high, mean? Being a fever, a high okay. fever, or a low fever, as I mentioned before, mm -hmm. um, or their labs show a high white cell count, or they have a high respiratory rate, or a high heart rate. Something, can, just something that might trigger concern. Right, mm -hmm. yeah. So they can call a, a sepsis code overhead, getting the entire rapid response team there at the bedside to evaluate the patient's because after all, I mean, we have to initiate therapy as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. The earlier we get those antibiotics in, uh, the better. For every hour of antibiotic delay, there's an eight to 10% increase in mortality. That is a so, very scary statistic. So can people find like on the website or something, the, the symptoms and the signs so that they will can educate themselves? So there's a website called sepsis.org. And on there is a lot of information about um, signs, symptoms, uh, how to talk to your doctor, questions to ask. If someone has an infection and they go to their provider, they should say, could this be sepsis? We all have to start using the word and promoting sepsis awareness. Get the stigma away from it, right? Yep. All right. I want to add something to that. I, I want people to realize that just like stroke is an emergency, a medical emergency and a heart attack is a medical emergency. Sepsis is a medical emergency. And the way I explain it to my patients, it's an attack on your organs. So and it's trauma to your organs. So when people hear the word trauma, then it's they, a huge thing, right? Yeah, then you or recognize hear, it. Right. So you it's a trauma to your organs. You need to get help. Right. All right, we're going to take another quick break, but don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with more CHS Presents Lifestyles at the Heart of Health. Thank you. 
Welcome back to CHS Presents Lifestyles at the Heart of Health. We're continuing our conversation about sepsis with Dr. Klott and Lori Yudidsky from St. Catherine of Siena Medical Center. So we've got a couple of minutes here for some last thoughts. I know that you believe that we really need to deal with this far more effectively mm -hmm. around the world because sure. it's a big deal. Yep, absolutely. So as I said, you know, it is a killer. Sepsis is a killer. It has a high mortality rate. Uh, and just to give you some statistics, about 258,000 people per year die in the United States from sepsis. Worldwide, there are about 8 million deaths annually. That's crazy numbers, pretty scary. Mm -hmm. um, what I want people to know also is that it is the number one leading cause of mortality for inpatients, hospitalized patients. So I want people to take away three things. Number one, early recognition of sepsis will save your life. Number two, Early antibiotic administration will save your life. And number three, early and aggressive fluid resuscitation will save your life. And you've seen it happen. Yes, when absolutely. When you yep. catch it early, people live. And when we catch it early, we can prevent that cascade from sepsis all the way to septic shock. Mm -hmm. And Lori, I know you deal with patients all the time and have seen the impact on their families. What's that like? Families struggle when they see their loved one come in and they're in severe sepsis or septic shock and they worry that they don't know what the outcome is going to be. Are they going to survive this? It's scary for them. It's scary for the patients. Sometimes the patients don't even have a recollection of what they went through, but the families sit vigil as patients may lose their autonomy. When they go home, they're weak. They are fatigued. They lose some of their concentration, their memory. There could be long-term effects of sepsis beyond just being in the hospital. They may need more support. They may need rehab. Just like somebody may take time recovering from a stroke situation, they may have that same requirement after sepsis. Recognizing it early is the key. Don't wait. You know, having been there with my brother and watching him and not knowing what was yeah. going to happen next, and he did have to go into rehab. He was in the hospital for three months. It was a really frightening moment. So you guys are working hard to spare families mm -hmm. from that. But when they do recover? People can recover. Most people recover fully from sepsis. Um, it's, you know, but some don't. And some do have long-term consequences. I met a lovely lady not too long ago that had four amputations because it progressed so quickly. So any early signs, symptoms, talk to your provider, go to the emergency room, treat this as an emergency. And I'm sure you echo that thought. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Deal with it, deal with it quickly, and be informed. Well, we hope today has helped inform a lot of people out there that are watching. Thank you for all that you do. We really appreciate you being here. Thank you for Thank having you. us. Thank you Thank so you. much. As always, for more information or to schedule an appointment at one of Catholic Health Service's six outstanding hospitals, you can call 1-855-CHS-4500 or visit chsli.org. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Jane Hansen, wishing you goodbye and good health.